program is brought to you in association with First National Bank of Botswana. The lives of well-known people who are in the public space are usually preconceived to be of luxury, travel, money, fame, and all the other things that the ordinary person may not be associated with. While their stardom is often celebrated, their being and essence is seldom viewed from a perspective of truly knowing who they are. Tonight, our guest is media personality and content creator, Khaona Dindwe. She was once a radio presenter and television presenter in her formative years, later becoming a YouTuber with Khaona Live. Currently, this media dynamite is a television newsreader, a corporate events MC, an entrepreneur amongst other endeavors. Khaona is a lady from the very small village of Lenzueli Muriti. She was, however, born in Khaburoni, where she was raised with her three siblings, one older brother and two younger sisters. When she became of age, she started school at Lechaya Primary School, then Malga Junior Secondary School, and did her senior schooling at Khaburoni Senior Secondary School, then back to Lechaya for her A-levels. Growing up, she says she was a shy person, but sought to use the stage as a means for expressing herself. She loved acting so much that she wanted to study performing arts. But when that did not happen, she settled for communications and media studies. Today, she's a media powerhouse in the country and is here on First Issues to talk about her being. Apart from everything that I've done in the media space, I'm just the girl from Lenzuelo Moriti. Lenzuelo Moriti is a tiny little village. I usually say it's the ruralest of the rural areas, but like, yeah, uh, you know, we pride ourselves uh, on that. It's a tiny little village within the Mashatu Game Reserve in the Tuli block. So right there at the eastern tip of Botswana, uh, that is where Lenzuelo Moriti is. It's a village, yeah, Masio Nihela. Uh, you know, there's a whole story there, but like that is where I come from. Uh, apparently I started talking even before I could walk, right? Like I started being able to articulate myself. So I think I was always meant for the media space, right? My mom usually gives us, you know, shares the story about when I was younger, uh, Lenzuelo Moriti is about, let's say 600 Ks from here. So apparently driving there, they would take turns, all the adults would take turns listening to me because I wouldn't stop going on. Like, I would just be talking. But I would have, okay, you know, so that's just me. You say um, you were meant for this space. You were meant to be a media personality. So how did you end up realizing that, that becoming your reality? Very honestly, I never imagined I'd be a media personality growing up. So I used to be that little girl who didn't trust her voice. And even in class, I was afraid to raise my hand because I just didn't trust my voice. Like, you know, I just, I, I don't know what to call it, but I just like panic when I have to, you know, speak up. So I was that girl. And then I discovered drama, you know, so every end of the year, because I went to high primary school, there would be like these Christmas uh, plays. And I always wanted to participate in that solely for a, a, an opportunity to be somebody else you know, an opportunity to express myself, you know, in a way that I know under normal circumstances in my authentic being, I couldn't, right? So I really just loved getting on stage and expressing myself. And I took that passion right from Lakai Primary School to Malka Secondary School to GSS. Just escape into whoever it is that I have to get into character to become. So after completion um, of my BGCSE, I remember what my parents said to me is that, okay, we see you love drama. And if you want to do your drama, all we want from you is for you to get good grades for your BGCSE PASA and you can go do drama. And then I applied. I remember back then, I think Pretoria Technican was one of the best uh, performing arts schools alongside your UC, your, your, I think it was Stellenbosch, you know, your, your roads. So I got so excited and applied and I thought I was gonna get this, you know what I mean? I remember that was the first time I heard the word portfolio because they needed a portfolio from me and I had nothing, no evidence of all the work I'd done on stage. Because when you think about it back then, 
you know, also suddenly this era where we capture things on camera and all of that, there was no social media. So there was no evidence that I was good on stage. So unfortunately, they needed a portfolio and I couldn't get uh, accepted there. And then it was last minute, I needed to apply for tertiary. My mom worked for UB, UB wasn't an option. So then I applied to Monash, South Africa, uh, and I went and studied communications and media studies. And for me, it was just, okay, let me settle, get learning. When I got to Manash, one of my other passions is hairdressing. So I'd started doing hair, I think at age 14. So when I got to Manash, I was the resident uh, hairdresser. You know what I mean? Like everybody came to me. I was making extra income. By the time I graduated, I think I could literally make about 4K a month. So my thing was, okay, so I'm already making 4,000. Everyone else wants to, uh, to go start working because they want to make the kind of money you're making. This is in 2004, right? So then I decided I'm going to set up a mobile hair salon. That's what I'm going to do, you know, and just franchise it over time. And I could literally envision how it was all going to work out. On my way back from graduation in February 2015, my family and I had a car accident and I broke my arm. So unfortunately, I couldn't continue plaiting. That's how I ended up applying uh, because now I needed a job. I applied to the Department of Broadcasting Services uh, to become, what is it? Is, is it a broadcasting officer? I didn't even know what that was. And that's how I ended up on RB2. Mm -hmm. So first day of RB2, I was there. I, like, I'm told, okay, you're gonna go, you're gonna work on radio. I'm like, okay, what does that even entail? So I literally landed in the media space accidentally just cause I couldn't do what I'd initially wanted to do cause I'd broken my arm. And that's just how it all began. At one point, I remember um, you just upped and left for Nigeria. It was a moment of shock. It was a moment of confusion. But, um, you know, most of us were excited for you to see, you know, the sort of prospects that were going to come out for you um, in Nigeria. But really, could you please tell us what happened then? What was happening? I love how people just thought, I wish I had the guts to just up and leave, right? Because to this day, I've been planning, you know, to just up and leave, but I've never been able to do that. So what happened with Nigeria Lagos was that in 2014, I was one of 15 Botswana who were part of the initial cohort of the Washington Fellowship, uh, you know, an initiative by President Barack Obama to invest in future African leaders. So I was one of those 15 uh, who were part of that first cohort. I think there were about 500 of us in the United States and taken to different, you know, uh, institutions. I was one of 25, I think I was at Yale University for six weeks and then we eventually converged in Washington DC, got to meet President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. So during that year or during that, uh, you know, first cohort, we were offered an internship anywhere across Africa. So I never knew I was going to go to Lagos, but I think what also happened is that some of my closest friends during the fellowship were Nigerians. And I just, just fell in love with Nigeria because there was just this, this aggression and this, this, they were so industrious. Little things like just being in class and being asked about what you do. A lot of people found out that I'm actually a media personality when we got to Washington Fellowship, to, to Washington DC, and we, you know, we were now interacting with other Batana. That's when they're like, Oh, you work on, really? You know what I mean? Because I just didn't have the confidence to, you know, articulate it, to sell myself. But the, the exact opposite was the case of Nigerians. They were tooting their horns and actually if they had to exaggerate it, they would exaggerate it. So I think I just fell in love with that. I was like, if this could rub off on me, I would really love it too. Came back, applied for a fellowship. I really didn't know where I was going to go. And just like that, I think in April 2015, I was offered an internship in Lagos, Nigeria, at an organization called the International Center for Leadership Development. Uh, you know, so all they basically did was, uh, you know, workshops and seminars for literally from primary school to tertiary uh, school uh, students to, to just empower them, uh, you know, to just give them leadership skills literally from as young as that. So that is what I was doing in Nigeria for those three months. So I was in Lagos from March to September 2015. And I remember I decided then that I'm not even coming back, right? Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, so I got a little job offer, but I think back then what I was making here compared to what I was offered there, you know, like I just felt it made more sense to come back home. And then over and above that, I had, uh, I remember back then she was the, the MD of Mnet Africa. Her name was Biola Alabi. I had the, uh, you know, opportunity to have her mentor me, especially during my stay in Lagos. And one of the things she said to me is that there's a population of 200 million 
in Nigeria, there are a lot of people who want to become what you're trying to become, right? Mm -hmm. So I would not advise you to stay here. I would say go back home, build your brand and your name to a point where now the world is going to demand a piece of you. Mm -hmm. You know, so build yourself at home and then from that point onwards now you can venture into you know the region or you know the international global stage but don't come here and start from the bottom from because from what you say you've been doing this for nine years so why would you want to then come and be a nobody here you know go back home build this brand and then you know your brand will speak for itself so that's exactly what happened uh, i came back home and then just continued to just keep pushing and, you know, building. Then I came back and built Hana Life, the company, uh, you know, back then were content creators and really pushing hard on, on YouTube. And I was really hoping to commercialize the YouTube space. But, you know, unfortunately, it wasn't the case. It was one of the toughest periods of my life. We know you are an avid endometriosis activist. Talk us through how you became one. It's a subject that isn't spoken about enough, right? I've always had excruciating period pains. You know, I was that girl who would be in debilitating pain when I was on my periods. I would have to, to miss about three to four days of school, you know, and that went on to tertiary, went on to even, you know, my career on radio. I literally missed a couple of days because of my hectic, hectic periods. Endometriosis is a reproductive condition that affects women in their reproductive years. And what basically happens is that the lining of the uterus, which should exist inside the uterus, is found in other parts of your body. Uh, so what happens is every month when the lining of the uterus is shed, when you get your periods, you also bleed in all these other places where this lining exists. So that is exactly what was happening to me for those many years, and I wasn't even conscious of it. So it causes really, really uh, debilitating pain, because you can imagine then, instead of just having regular period pains, you're aching in other parts of your body, right? And you know, some of the symptoms are heavy periods, are pain uh, during your periods, pain even when you're not on your periods, and in, you know, 50% of the cases, infertility as well. So that is the reason why I decided to create awareness, because I was like, I need to empower the next woman. I wish somebody, so for the longest time, I'd say, why don't I know about, why hasn't anybody mentioned the fact that there's endometriosis? But I got to a point where I was like, I need to be the change that I need to see in the world, you know? So where is Hana now? And where is she going? So Hana now is at a point where uh, I want to build a global brand. I think I'm at a point where I'm now, you know, I'm like, okay, I've, I've done as much as I can for my country, in my country. So, but because I'm passionate about what I'm doing, I would really like to take my brand beyond Botswana. And that does not necessarily, uh, you know, mean I want to leave the country. What I've come to notice is that I can work in other parts of the country from right here. So what is currently happening, you know, one of the things that I'm doing right now, I've also built, because of the brand that I've built uh, in the online space, I'm doing a lot of brand collaborations and I've started getting a lot of work from like, you know, global companies from everywhere. Literally, I've collaborated with a partner in, in with, a, with a company in India, in the United States, in South Africa, you know, so that is the kind of work that I'm doing now to just position my brand, you know, beyond our, but to just say Hana Live is a global brand. So first of all, that is one thing that I'd like to continue growing in. I've also got Hana Media now, which is also um, a, a communications consultancy. Uh, and, you know, one of the companies that I'm currently working on with right now is child line uh, an organization very close to my heart and what we're working on is creating uh, the communication and PR strategy so you know that is work that is happening and I'm looking forward to doing more work in the consultancy space because I'm like I've been doing this for the last 16 years how about I extend now the expertise that I've built to other organizations that could possibly need to package themselves. So I'm doing that as well. And of course, I rise. I like to see I rise diversifying. I like to diversify my product range and not just, you know, sell uh, sleep and loungewear. So that's another thing. And also building the Hana Dinta Foundation now, which aims to continue to create awareness on endometriosis. But beyond that, to also, uh, you know, empower women, especially who are struggling with infertility, to know that but infertility has treatment. And by that, I mean there is a thing such as fertility treatment. It's mm -hmm. not spoken about enough, right? Yeah. So when you think about, about it, Musadi Ogolin Zuelumuriti doesn't know. As far as she knows, 
she's barren. Even though that's what she's called. Kyop said hello so tulin, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So I really want to, you know, extend a hand to people like that to actually help them access fertility treatment, you know, to actually give them an opportunity, especially the underprivileged as well as the low income earners through the foundation to get an opportunity to also have families.